our next speaker, he's been on the circuit for a while, folks, Mr. Peter Kelly from SourceBox. He's going to be talking to us about the evolution of high availability. Okay. Right, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me back again to, um, to do another talk, another presentation um, on the evolution of high availability with Open6. Um, and the kind of idea for this presentation came when I was working with some new features with Open Sips 3, um, and it was it was involved in in <coughs> dealing with some high availability scenarios. And I kind of, because I've been working with Open Sips now since probably 2007, um, or, or Open Server, I think, as it was called then. Um, and I kind of realised, wow, this has come a long way. It's it's a lot different <coughs> to how how we used to have to do these things. So I thought it would be useful just to have a a small presentation just to outline how how things were and how things are now and, and the steps the steps that we've taken to get there. So I said, my name is Peter Kelly. Um, work with a, a company called Sourcebox in the UK, um, and we do open source telecommunications consultancy. Um, so we get involved in the, in the <coughs> usual arenas sort of open sips, free switch asterisk, least cost routing, calling cards. Basically anything that open SIPs and free switch related we, we get involved in in any open source technologies. Um, we've got another business that we just started called CoreWise. It's kind of um, happened by accident. We ended up writing a PBX for somebody um, using open SIPs, free switch, the usual open source, um, the usual open source um, candidates. Um, and we've kind of ended up uh, turning it into a product. Um, so I thought I'd just put a, a bit of a slide on there about it. Um, in case anyone wants to look, it's all open source, um, product driven. Um, so what is high availability? Um, I said that I have been working with OpenSips since 2007. Before that, I was a web developer. Um, so sort of previous to that, high availability would, all, would have been all about sort of load balancing web requests. So when, a, when a request gets made to, a, made to a server, it would come through the cloud, go through a load balancer, go to web server A, web server B, who knows. Um, but it actually, it, it's actually um, all about just getting that request to the server and getting the response back. You'd use a session token, perhaps, to identify the user. And it was a fairly simple problem to solve. Now, I learnt through working with open SIPs in the VoIP world that the problem is a little bit different when you're dealing with SIP, because you have a diagram that looks almost exactly the same as when you're load balancing for, say, a web request. Um, but the key difference here is that a SIP or a VoIP session will last a lot, lot longer than a typical TCP um, um, request <coughs> for a web page, uh, for example. Um, so when you're load balancing a SIP session, you're having to load balance the entire thing <coughs> at the beginning, and then you're having to maintain that path through the servers um, for the entire duration of the call, which can last for you know, minutes or hours or, or even days in some, some scenarios. So once you've established that chain of servers, you really have to make sure that chain of servers is going to be maintained for the entire duration of your call. And these are the challenges that come when you kind of load balancing um, with open tips. So just a quick example, which I'm sure I've used before um, previous slides. Um, so we have an example here of a phone making a call through OpenSips, and as we can see, it is making a call to a fully qualified domain name, which is example.com, which is fine. But when the session is actually established, um, we end up with IP addresses um, in our SIP messages, in our SIP requests. So you never see that fully qualified domain name again. Um, and again, that alludes to what I said in the previous slide. Once you have this session established um, in SIP, the IP addresses are very important, and the IP addresses have to, have to be maintained throughout the entire session um, when you're talking about high availability. And it's the same with the media stream at the bottom. Um, the media stream will flow from IP to IP, um, and that, that, those IP addresses must, must stay there, or you have to have processes in place to make sure that those IP addresses stay in place in order for the media to flow. Um, okay. I found a new bouncing, bouncing slide, uh, obvi nice. obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, so once again, for the duration of the call, um, the all IP addresses in the proxy chain must remain available and able to any SIP related to the call. 
and the media streams that I've said also rely on the IP addresses. Um, so how does OpenSIPs solve high availability? So when I started working with OpenSIPs, a typical deployment, you'd have OpenSIPs uh, involved, obviously. Um, you would have uh, your servers involved, which would tend to be bare metal. Um, nowadays, you can have virtual machines or cloud-based servers um, as alternatives. <coughs> you still use bare metal if you wish. Um, you tend to have a database involved. Certainly, um, <coughs> 10 years ago, uh, you normally would have a relational databa database or no SQL. Um, you have to deal with the network topology, either a virtual network or a fixed network. Um, and you also have to deal with disasters, sort of the classic disaster that everyone likes to throw in is what happens if a bomb drops on London and your data centre goes. Um, so um, th these are all the kind of moving parts um, that you have to deal with uh, when you're dealing with high availability uh, in a SIP deployment. Um, and in the very distant past, OpenSIPs 1.4, which I think was the first version of OpenSIPs, um, this is typically um, how it would look. So you'd have two open SIP servers, um, which is a kind of a very fixed number, and you'd have a shared virtual IP between them, um, and then you would have um, Monit, which is a, or something similar, which is a monitoring application that can monitor open SIPs and can restart open SIPs if anything goes wrong, and then you'd have various other tools like VRRP or UCAR or Keep Alive D to monitor the virtual IP. Um, and so there you'd have your kind of physical hardware set up. And then you would have to do manual things to share information between the two OpenSIPs instances. So you can see I've got the register and the two replicates um, at the bottom there. Um, in order, so with a shared VIP, only one of the OpenSIPs boxes would have the virtual IP at any one time. And you would have to tell the secondary OpenSIP box um, about, for example, user location information. And you'd have to manually code that into the configuration yourself and say, hey, I'm going to send you a register packet, and, you, and then you're going to recognize that this has already been pre-authorized, authenticated, and you're just going to store it in your user location database just in case you become the master open SIPs. So it's quite a complicated and convoluted way of doing it, but it, it does achieve this, the kind of high availability that you need. So if one of the open SIPs should crash or go down, then the other one can take over and have all the information it needs. And it's similar with the dialog information. Um, the dialog module in open SIP stores information about ongoing dialogues. Um, and in open 1.4, you could flush them to a database. Um, so, so if anything happened to open SIPs, if you had to restart open SIPs, it could read all the information back out of the database. Um, so again, it's a fairly manual process. You'd flush all the information to a database periodically, and then if another OpenSIPs took over, you would then have to make sure that it read all the dialog information in. Um, and again, I've just put a note at the bottom that the cloud, the cloud kind of environment was probably unheard of um, in this kind of era. Um, yeah, so just a kind of s summary of this, this configuration. Um, when I look back at, back at it, it's actually quite rigid in design. Um, you know, you've, you've got two OpenSIPs boxes here. And you can only really have two OpenSIPs boxes because you've manually added code into your configuration to say, your OpenSIPs box master or, or OpenSIPs slave and send extra information to the other box. If you added more boxes in, it would get incredibly complicated having to kind of manually know which box was master and which wasn't. Um, so, I, so looking back at it, I think it was quite a rigid in design. Again, also with the shared virtual IP approach, um, you kind of having to manually have awareness of which box has got the virtual IP at any one time and, and, and keep track of that. Um, so there were some evolutions that were then made. Um, Opus 1.10 um, is very similar to the previous scenario, but this is when the guys added um, the UDP socket communication. <coughs> so you can see at the bottom now, there's now no need for the dialogue um, sharing database, which we had before, <coughs> and there's also no need for the T-replicate function. So it kind of simplified things. Um, you could tell OpenSIPs A to talk to OpenSIPs B and share registrar information, share user location information, uh, and share dialogue information. 
So that simplified things a lot. Um, but again, we still got this situation where you've got two open six boxes um, and a shared, a shared virtual IP. Um, so the real big change, I think, came with Open Six 2.2 onwards, where the guys added the cluster module. And my interpretation of the cluster module was that an evolution of the the UDP communication module. They changed it, so it was now encapsulated in its own module, the cluster module, and it would use TCP communication. Um, and at this point, it was then also possible to have multiple OpenSIPS instances within a cluster. So rather than just having OpenSIPS A and OpenSIPS B, you could have many, many nodes in a cluster, um, and you would just simply give a give a give a node its own name, give it some neighbor information, and each OpenSIPS box will now learn about the neighbors within the cluster. And once you've enabled that module, you can then add things on top of it. So you can add on, um, for example, registrar or user location information and say, OK, share this information between uh, open six boxes. Um, you can do the same with the dialogue module. Uh, you can do the same with load balancer now, I believe, rate limiting, dynamic routing. So there's lots and lots of modules that can now share information between n open six instances um, just by using this cluster module. So we've kind of very quickly gone away from this situation where we're we're having awareness in the configuration script of how many open six boxes there are and, and rep sending information to all the adjacent ones to having this nice cluster of module that can basically just say, hey, add as many nodes as we want and just share all the information between them. <coughs> that, that's quite a big step in, in solving the high availability problem. And this solution works really well, especially on a bare metal scenario. So if you've got servers that are running as servers with their own fixed IP addresses, it's great. Um, as I say, just to kind of summarize, we don't need any of the sharing via database anymore. You can use a VIP still if you want to, but it's now much easier to not use a virtual IP. Um, and then you get to bring both, or both, I say both, you can have many open six boxes. You can bring many open six boxes into play um, and have them all targeted independently with their own IP addresses. Um, um, and we can still use Monit to monitor open SIPs if we need to. So that was the bare metal scenario. Now the problems that we were having was when we had customers, and we've had a few customers who, oops, who would deploy open SIPs into a cloud environment, which would typically be AWS or Azure, etc. Um, and what we would find is that. Load all this up. Is that the when you deploy OpenSIPs into a cloud environment, there's no um, OpenSIPs doesn't know what the public IP address is. It only has a local IP address. You have to use the aliasing aspect within OpenSIPs, which allows you to give OpenSIPs awareness of its public IP address. So in this diagram here, you will see that um, OpenSIPs has a local IP address. We have two nodes in the cluster. Each one has a local IP address. The public IP address is distinct from OpenSIPs. It's separate. But by using the alias, um, the aliasing feature, um, where you see the listen line, you can tell OpenSIPs what the public IP address is. And OpenSIPs will then replace the IPs in the SIP with the public IP address rather than the local IP address. The big problem that comes <coughs> next is that when a node should fail, so if node 2 should fail, you can easily bring up another node in its place, but it will typically come back with a different local IP address. Um, and when OpenSIPs is sharing information between nodes about, um, about dialogues, for example, the local IP address that has been used for each dialogue is very important. Um, so what we were finding was that we would, we, excuse me, what we were finding was that the cluster module was unable to, to share information <coughs> about uh, dialogues when the IP address wasn't known by, the, by one of the adjacent nodes. <coughs> um, and what ended up happening was we had a feature that I think Bogdan added in OpenSIPS 3, 
which allows you to tag an interface. So rather than, a, rather than an interface just having a local IP address and an alias, it can now have a tag. And this allows OpenSIPs to share information um, between nodes about interfaces by using a tag rather than a local IP address. So as long as, the, as, long as an, a node recognizes the tag it's been given information for, it will continue to sort of receive the dialogues and it will continue to, to share the dialogues between the nodes. And it will also allow you to bring up another server in place. So for example, server A here um, uh, has a, lo a local IP address of 172.20.30.40. Its replacement has a different IP address, 172.20.30.45. Because they both have the same tag name, which is interface one, that information will have been shared with other with other nodes in the cluster, and it will then be able to receive um, receive the information back when it comes back as a new node in the cluster. Um, so, with all these kind of enhancements and improvements, this is kind of what I was working with a couple of months ago when I thought, how far look how far we've come. We, we can simply create as many OpenSIPs nodes as we need. We can cluster them with the, with the cluster module. They will talk to each other automatically. We don't really care what the local IP addresses are anymore because we can use interface tagging, um, so that can be shared between the cluster uh, automatically. Um, and it now becomes a much, much less manual process to, to sort of do a high availability with OpenSIPs. And I think it kind of alludes to what Bogdan was saying in the first presentation as well, is like, it's very much kind of getting more DevOps focused now, so you can just basically throw it out there and it will work, and throw another one out there and that will continue to work. Whereas certainly 10 years ago, it was very much a, a manual process to maintain sort of more than one open SIPs and keep them in sync with each other. Um, yeah, there is the one other option. Um, open SIPs also supports um, any casting, so it's not something I personally. Um, had any experience of, but I'm sure there's people in the room that have. And this is the concept of the same IP being present in multiple data centers on multiple locations around the internet. Um, <coughs> so if one should go down, which is the classic, what happens if a bomb should drop on a city <coughs> scenario, um, then all the SIP will continue to route to the same IP address, just in a different location. And the kind of cluster topology and the ability to have any casting um, within the cluster uh, allows you to to, scare, to have a high availability even at that level as well. Um, but it relies on you having control of the network IP topology. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, IP addresses are really important to SIP. Um, proxying SIP relies on them. Um, and you say we have the open SIP toolbox approach, and it lets you solve the high availability problem in many ways. Um, we've now got the interface aliasing with OpenSIPS 3, which allows you to have an, an OpenSIPS cluster in a one-to-one -one NAT scenario, uh, a cloud scenario. Um, and we have the cluster module that you can use in any, scenario, in any situation uh, for information sharing. <coughs> um, well, that's it. Um, are there any questions? Wow. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got uh, we've got about six minutes left here, Pete. Okay. And uh, I forgot my poll. So. Um, did Did you want me to show the end of the Game of Thrones episode? Well, we had talked about that. And I was surprised you just didn't segue into it. So I'm trying to buy you some time while you load it up. We're going to be seeing just the ending two minutes of Game of Thrones. And if that's a question that says, please don't put it up, we don't want to hear about it. We have a question for you, Pete. Your examples show two open tips instances. Yes. With a communication bilaterally between the two. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about what would happen if you had, for example, 20 open tips instances? Would the communication be full mesh, or is there some kind of hierarchy in the document? Um, I believe that's probably a question for, for Razvan or, or, or Bogdan, but I believe um, it is. Who is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is our new boat done. 
basically, push the button. No. It's working now. No. Okay. Yeah, it's working. It was working already. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the idea is that you can have as many instances as you want because you don't really rely on the. Um, that's why we only made a tagging, so it's not pre-configured. So uh, whenever you want to power up a new instance with the same tag, it will just be part of that specific uh, uh, that specific group. You'll still need to add it in the cluster. So to get all the replicated information, but basically it can scale up to a different number. No? That's not the answer to his question. This man is not satisfied with your words. Okay. <laughs> why not? This is why I gave it to Asvan. <laughs> 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 That was a yes or no question. <laughs> he wasn't looking for affirmation on a statement. Was that sufficient enough or you sure? Because we got them all day. We have another question in the back here. Yep, right up here in the front first. I'll be to you in just a second. And um, what about the props of the registrations that the proxy sends to the CPEs to, to take the, the nut hole uh, open? in this scenario, so that the, the association with the CPE is, is static uh, and how the system, <coughs> that, uh, uh, some CPE of, of the system have to move to a specific instance if we have more than two. Um, so, so the question, how does the, how does the, when, when uh, uh, so as I understood the, the association between the the which uh, instance of the uh, of OpenSIX is yeah. working with a specific CPE mm -hmm. is made on uh, uh, IP addresses. Yes. So yes. Right yeah, so in the in the in the in the rich in the kind of we the question was about the NAT, wasn't it, for the registration? The NAT and the balance system. Yeah, yeah. because it's maintaining all the functionality when you've got that information in 20 to yeah. So in the scenario, I think in a scenario where you've got a, vi a virtual IP address, obviously the, vi the the IP address comes comes onto the second over six box, so the the kind of NAT information it is transferred and stays the same. Um, I think in the, with a cluster scenario. Um, I'm not sure what what would what would happen with the net. So in the, in the load balancer yeah. in front of the open six, yeah. I, I should configure it to be uh, static. So when yeah. it say uh, see a session from a specific IP, it choose one of the server behind, one of the open six server behind, yeah. and the connection should be uh, stable with that server yes. and only that server. Yes, but uh, until but, but yeah, and if it crashes and if another one comes up in its place, if you use the tagging. Then, well, if it crashes, another one doesn't come up in its place. And if you use a tagging, then another another OpenSIP server within the cluster can also handle the can also handle the request. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Pete, that was a really good try. Okay. <laughs> so, word on the vine is basically the scenario. In all cases, you're going to have a master that's going to be interacting with the CPE. So that master. The first one taking in the traffic, and again, it depends on the topology. If you're doing something like Anycast or something like that, I was thinking in a, an active-active scenario, like uh, so. Where there is a load balancer so yeah, you, well, you need Anycast, or like again, on the interface tagging, it's most likely going to be, you know, your master. There's going to be a master at some point, some way, okay. unless you're using something like Anycast and delivering the packet to every single open SIPs. Okay. But in your routing, whether it's through a fully qualified domain or some type of different route, you know, preferences, you're going to end up picking somehow, some way, a master. And that master, to answer your question, will be involved in dealing with all the that for the CPE. Okay. Treading water, man. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? That was your question? <laughs> you sure? You've got about two minutes before I make it back there. Come up with another one. Really? You did have another one, see? What was your question? Pete, we've got a vote for the uh, Game of Thrones ending. <laughs> have you worked this out yet? <laughs>
I'm not doing Okay, it. so uh, without further ado, we're going to get Pete off the stage. Pete Kelly from Sourcebox, people. Thank you very much.